hope this doesn't look too uh, awkward. It's uh, the result of my being too tall for any podium. I'd like to thank the uh, U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center for inviting me to take part in this distinguished lecture series. For almost 40 years since the Army Military History Research Collection, I've been conducting research here at Carlisle Barracks. And uh, I hope that this association, so beneficial to me, will continue, despite the uh, misguided efforts of some people to close or reduce this institution in the name of false economy. Uh, of those 40 years, uh, I've been writing and researching books on the American Civil War. It wasn't until about seven or eight years ago I found myself finally pulled into the 20th century to write a book about World War II. And that book uh, appeared in publication just about a year ago. The title is War in the Ruins. The subtitle is The American Army's Final Battle Against Nazi Germany. But I've got to tell you, those, those titles are somewhat misleading. Originally, the book was going to be about a particular battle a battle in Heilbronn, Germany, in April 1945, only one month before Germany surrendered to the Allies. It was a nine-day, block by block, building by building clearing action of a city that had been pounded to pieces by Allied bombers and was basically one big rubble pile. But in that pile, thousands of Germans defended their city including regular troops and militia, uh, including 13 and 14 year old kids, 70 year old grandfathers and female snipers. Sort of Hitler's last stand in Western Germany. But soon after beginning research, I discovered two things. One was, even with all the sources at my disposal, I didn't think I had enough to support an entire book about one battle. But Secondly, I became much more interested in the American force fighting that battle than in the fighting itself. And that force was the 100th Infantry Division, known as the Century Division. It was a respected and highly successful, but badly neglected military organization. Neglected mainly because, since it was in uh, France and uh, 1944 and 45, it fought well to the south of more celebrated units under Patton, Bradley, Montgomery, and under General Eisenhower's more immediate control. Now, the book that I wrote and my talk tonight will cover operations to some extent, battles and campaigns. However, I'd like to keep the focus, as I did in the book, on the unit itself on the young men who made it up, who they were, uh, how they adapted to military life, and what their experiences were out of as well as in combat. Many of those experiences were told to me personally in the form of oral interviews. And I'll tell you, it's a novel experience for a Civil War historian to be able to personally interview the people he's writing about. Fortunately, in 2006, the 100th Division Association held its annual reunion in Richmond, only an hour's drive from our home in Newport News, Virginia. So I went there, and with the help of my wife Ann and our daughter Katie, interviewed several dozen veterans and got many hours worth of reminiscences from them. Other veterans I later interviewed by email and over the phone, and supplemented the first person account research with at least 70 uh, written memoirs by the veterans, most of them self-published. Many of those experiences as related to me were very graphic and hard hit. One of the veterans told me, he said, if you want to tell our full story, tell it all, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I attempted to do that, and I think I succeeded to a certain degree, per perhaps too well because the publisher cut out of my original manuscript several extreme passages uh, with incidents I would call the crude and the cruel, which he thought might turn off too many readers. Now, therefore, I think my original manuscript is probably grittier than the published book. However, one of the veterans who I did not get to interview to my regret was my father. 
uh, Technical Sergeant Edgar Longacre of the Cannon Company attached to one of the infantry regiments in the division. Like uh, many World War II veterans, Dad was very closed-mouthed about his military experiences. Couldn't get much information from him, even in response to direct questions. But in the early 1990s, I helped move my parents from the house I grew up in in New Jersey into a retirement home. And I found in the basement a diary that my father had kept of the last weeks of the war in France and Germany, about which he had long forgotten. He had sent a day-by-day -day account in letters to my mother, who he had married just before he got drafted in 1942. She had carefully preserved them. The diary is very interesting, very illuminating, because it spoke of events I had no uh, particular knowledge of and had mentioned this Battle of Heilbronn prominently. So it was, in effect, the, uh, the impetus, the inspiration behind my book. Unfortunately, my father died in 1998 at age 85 before I, I really got into the project. My hope is that he would have approved of the finished project. The 100th Infantry Division got off to a quiet start about 11 months after Pearl Harbor. On November the 15th, 1942, it was activated at Fort Jackson, South Carolina, and was assigned to the command of Major General Withers Alexander Barris, a native Virginian, a graduate of VMI, a combat veteran of World War I, and a graduate of the Command and General Staff School of Fort Leavenworth and of the Army War College then in Washington, D.C. Uh, Burris had forged a very notable career in the interwar army uh, for a, a stretch as the commandant, excuse me, assistant commandant of the infantry school at Fort Benning and later as commandant of his alma mater. He uh, impressed every superior with his technical know-how and his ability to motivate and inspire those men assigned to him. During both wars, he uh, gained a well-earned reputation for achieving assigned objectives without unduly risking the lives of his men. And every veteran I interviewed had the uh, greatest respect and the highest regard, for, even though they had, very few of them had ever met him personally, for Withers Barris. On the day that he formally accepted command of the division, Barris made a little speech in which he promised the parents of the troops to be assigned to him, quote, to give your sons the best in preparation for battle. Those preparations proved to be disjointed and much interrupted and long. It took months for enough able-bodied recruits to fill out the division's major components, the 397th, 398th, and 399th Infantry Regiments, four field artillery battalions, and a spectrum of support units. Basic training normally consumed 12 to 17 weeks, depending on circumstances, but the division as a whole trained for almost two years. BASIC began at Fort Jackson three days after Christmas. In mid-January 1943, physical training gave way to instruction on Jackson's uh, weapons range with emphasis on the M1 semi-automatic rifle, the Browning automatic rifle, the Colt 45 caliber pistol, air and water-cooled 30 caliber machine guns, and 60 and 81 millimeter mortars. Slowly, the would-be warriors came together to form a unified, cohesive force. I say slowly because no sentrymen appeared to be anything but soldier material. The majority were 18 and 19-year-olds fresh from the senior prom or with at most one year of college under their belts. For many, Army life could be an overwhelming experience. A typical recruit, Tom Tillett of the 399th, who I think hailed from this part of Pennsylvania, recalled that, it seemed to me that everyone else was older and about twice my size. Uh, the century took its men from every state of the Union, regional dialects were many, and he wrote, most spoke a language I had never heard before. He heard other words too. Swearing was something I had never used before, but soon it seemed as natural as if I had always spoken that way. And I've got to tell you, the diary of my father's contained a number of hells and dams in it, even though it was written to my mom. 
But after reading it, I asked my brother, do you ever remember Dad using a four-letter word? He said, no. And I don't think he ever did except during the war. I think he was trying to impress my mother with what a hardened veteran he had become. Like most recruits, however, Tom Tillett found his place in the Army. Twelve weeks of basic infantry training made me a man. Long hikes with a full pack would gradually get those muscles to another level. I started at 135 pounds and turned all of it to muscle. In the end, the division's recruits received a great deal more training than most other units of comparable size. In mid-November 1943, training at Fort Jackson finally ended with the men being shipped to the Tennessee Maneuver Area, a wide swath of the rugged Cumberland Plateau. For the next two months, they maneuvered over heavily wooded and elevated terrain, often in miserable weather, as part of a core size force. The training was fatiguing in the extreme, but it would stand the division in good stead when it reached Europe and began campaigning in the Vosges Mountains of eastern France. But by now, many recruits wondered if they ever would go overseas. At Fort Jackson, the Sentry had developed a reputation as a show division, performing combat simulations for visiting dignitaries, high-ranking officers, and businessmen courted by the War Department. In the summer of 1944, a 1,200-man battalion paraded through the streets of New York City to publicize a war bond drive. When the division was shipped from Tennessee to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, for yet another supplemental training program in January 1944, rumor had it that the division would never leave the states. It had acquired a reputation as a permanent training division or as some critics called it, a repel depot division. Army parlance were a replacement depot. Now the latter description had a lot of validity. By early 1944, the division had supplied units already in action in Europe and the Pacific with a steady stream of replacements. The number eventually topped 3,000, almost one-fifth of the division's original strength. This wholesale loss required a comparable transfusion of manpower, and the newcomers were the reason behind the third training program. Now, the newcomers were a motley group. They came from airborne military police and anti-aircraft uh, units, and included U.S. Army Air Force's pilot trainees. Hundreds came from special service units, including 500 soldier actors, from the recently disbanded Army War Show Task Force. Incidentally, one of the special services types was my father. He had played professional baseball for seven years before the war. He was scheduled to be shipped out to Europe in 1942, but at the last minute he was held back and put on the baseball team in Fort Dix. He helped the team win the East Coast Service Championship and in the off-season, he was in charge of maintaining part of the uh, outdoor sports complex at the post. And it was a good thing that he did. I might not be here. He was almost killed two or three times in the one year he put in in Europe. Uh, by far the largest source of replacement personnel was the Army Specialized Training Program. Since late 1942, thousands of recruits who had scored high on standardized IQ tests higher, in fact, than officer school candidates, had been studying at land-grant colleges across the country in such highly technical specialties as engineering, uh, foreign languages, personnel psychology, and military medicine. From my mid-1944, combat soldiers had become a greater priority than medics or linguists. As a result, most ASTPs, as they were known, were forcibly washed out, handed a rifle, and told to learn how to use it. As you might expect, few of the high Q recruits appreciated being ejected from the hallowed halls of learning. Sixty years later, one veteran called the abrupt transition, with more than a little bitterness, one big ripoff. <laughs> Nor did many ASTPs appreciate the brand of discipline demanded of them by their regular Army instructors, whom many considered functionally illiterate. As one youngster put it, we were quite confident of our intellectual abilities, smarter, in fact, than our officers. 
Tom Bourne, a G Company, 399th Infantry, today a retired architect living in Woodstock, Vermont, called, uh, recalled that we of the ASTP were very young, had been quite privileged for the most part, both in and out of the Army, and it was very easy for us at first to think of these guys, their instructors, as mindless cowboys and sadists. They were experienced professional soldiers who knew a great deal more about what we were supposed to be doing than we did, and they scorned us in turn as smart-ass kids. Now that had to change, and it did. Most of us turned out to be good soldiers when the time came to prove it, and most of us realized that the training cadre was one of the main reasons behind this. The training at Bragg lasted until the late summer of 44. Weeks earlier, the Allies had landed in Normandy, and now a second European front was opening in southern France. In mid-August, General Jacob Devers, 6th Army Group, launched an amphibious assault along the French Riviera and began to move north to link with the uh, troops that had landed on D-Day. By early September, the 100th Division was at last under orders to ship out somewhere. Most were ready to go. According to Bob Fair of the 399th, now a retired professor of business administration at the University of Virginia, most of us felt it was time we got into this war. This is not to say that we did not fear what lay ahead, but as a unit, our state of readiness and morale overwhelmed the fear. Now, not everyone in high authority was so confident about the century's ability. It was rumored that General Ben Lear, commander of the U.S. Ground Forces, on a recent tour of Bragg, had told some of Burris's aides, if the war is over, when this outfit goes overseas, then God bless you. If the war is still on, then God help you. <laughs> well, the division began to move by train from New York City, the part of embarkation, point port of embarkation, on September 25th, 1944. At Camp Kilmer, New Jersey, across the Hudson from Manhattan, they spent 10 days awaiting transportation to sail for southern France. Finally, on October the 5th, the Century boarded destroyer-escorted transports for the Atlantic voyage. The combinations were cramped and spartan, especially on one ship that had been imperfectly converted from a banana boat operated by the United Fruit Company. The journey was a memorable one, but for the wrong reasons. Four days out of New York, a hurricane, the worst in two decades, according to crew members, hit the convoy. At the height of the storm, two of the transports came perilously close to colliding. By the time, by the, time the ships reached Marseille on October the 18th, the men felt they had already been through a battle. Few locals came out to welcome the newcomers, but they received a sarcastic greeting from the radio propagandist Axis Sally. Welcome, 100th Infantry Show Division. We have 20 divisions waiting to welcome you. Uh, one veteran recalled, we enjoyed the dance music that she played, but the remark about the 20 divisions took the joy out of it. For 10 days, the division camped in the Marseille suburbs while weapons and equipment were unloaded and operational plans were drawn up. Liberal leave allowed many to visit France's oldest city. They ate bread and grapes, sipped wine from paper cups, and conversed haltingly with the locals, many of whom seemed war weary, despondent, even defeatist. The century experienced its first fatality on French soil when an inebriated soldier jumped from one of the city's fast-moving trolley cars, struck his head on a cobblestone street. Private Lowry Bowman of the 397th waited with the body until the graves registration detail arrived. They stowed the dead man and his belongings in the mattress cover that he and every other GI had brought with them from Fort Bryant. It occurred to Bowman that the dead man would be buried in it. Then it hit home, he wrote. Everyone had brought his own burial shroud to the war. The movement to the front made in a convoy of two and a half ton trucks began on the 28th. Three days later, the lead regiment, the 399th, disembarked outside saint Helene. Within a few days, the remainder of the division joined the 399th in that 
farming village in the foothills of the Vosges. En route, the men had been both impressed and sobered by the still smoldering wreckage of enemy tanks, trucks, and artillery uh, pieces that they passed, remnants of the Germans' failed attempt to escape the converging forces of Devers and the 12th Army Group of General Omar Bradley. At first, plans called for the division to begin operating in a relatively quiet sector of the front where they could rest and learn the ropes from the veteran divisions that had preceded them. Instead, as soon as they arrived, the century men were inserted into the front line as members of the 6th Army Corps, part of General Alexander Patch's 7th Army. The move was made necessary by the worn out condition of the 45th Infantry Division, which had spent itself while spearheading and driving toward high ground along the Mirth River between the towns of saint and rayon le -Tat. This offensive, rather whimsically styled Operation Dogface, formed a prelude to a larger push scheduled by Devers for mid-November. That movement was designed to carry the entire 6th Army Group, uh, which included not only 7th Army, but also the French 1st Army, through the Vosges and across the German border. On the dark and rainy evening of October 31st, one century men remembered it as a Halloween night with scares for us new boys fresh from the States. The century began to relieve the weary veterans of the 45th Division. Added to the thump of artillery in the near distance, wind and rain kept many awake throughout the night. Sentries were startled by noises in the dark and let loose with rifle rounds. At daylight, the men of L Company of the 399th discovered that they had inflicted the division's first kill in the war zone. The victim, a cow that had wandered off a neighboring farm. All too soon, the rookies saw lay a store for them. Tom Bourne was struck by, quote, the hollow-eyed, half-dead look on the faces of many of the veterans, a sight we had never seen before, but were soon to know well. When, the, when Lieutenant James Shields of the 399th met his bearded, rumpled counterpart in the 179th Infantry Regiment, the latter inquired about the size of his platoon. Forty men, said Shields. We got 18, his acquaintance remarked. Guess we'll have to dig more holes. One of the first missions that the replacements performed was patrol duty. One centryman described the process of reconnoitering toward unknown enemy positions, vulnerable to fire from all directions as the distilled essence of terror. A, a patrol conducted on November the 3rd resulted in the first combat casualties inflicted and absorbed by the division. On that occasion, a platoon of I Company of the 399th clashed with a German force near saint Remy. There the cry of medic went up from the division's ranks for the first time. It would be repeated countless times over the next six months. Foxhole life and near constant exposure to enemy fire quickly took a toll on the newcomers. After only a few days on the line, the men were anything but models of soldierly decorum. Surveying his buddies in A Company of the 398th, Private Thaddeus Samjeski described them as tired and already weary of war. There is little effort at hygiene, same old clothes day after day, same dirty, unshaven faces with bloodshot eyes, no brushing of teeth, no toothpaste, no brush. Just gag down a can of sea rations if you can, followed by a trip to the nearest tree. Not much in the oral end, not much out the anal, but lots of urination for some strange reason. The weather made conditions immeasurably worse 1944 would see the coldest winter in decades in that part of France. Snow, icy rain, and an ever-present sodden fog that drenched soldiers who had yet to be supplied with cold weather gear such as fur-lined overcoats and shoe packs. The ground around saint Remy was so hard that digging foxholes was often the lost cause. 19-year-old Dick Good of the 399th, who was my height, spent his first night on the line trying to sleep in a hole barely 18 inches deep. His platoon sergeant, John Angier, began to dig a foxhole on a night so dark, quote, you could not see your hand before your face. 
And every time your shovel would hit the dirt, those damn krauts would lob in a few mortar shells to let you know they were still up and awake. Tom Tillett spent one especially cold night outside his hole, kicking a tree to keep from freezing. The weather only added to the prevailing nervousness. Throughout his first weeks on the line, Jack Pointer, the 399th, expected to be attacked and overrun at any minute. The waiting made me so nervous I was shaking all over. I tried to hold it, but most of the other fellows were doing the same thing. The waiting finally ended on November the 12th when Devers' long-planned offensive got underway. By now the sentry was in line, in force, and General Burris had assumed command of the far left flank of the 6th Corps near the west bank of the Mirror. That morning, the sentry jumped, jumped off in division strength for the first time. The opposition consisted of infantry and armored units of the German 19th Army, which held both sides of the river. Burris prudently launched a limited attack against the west bank, holding its defenders in place, while crossing most of the division near Baccarat and pushing toward the enemy's rear via Real Notat. The crossing proved successful. Although the Germans on the east bank held strong positions, the 397th and 399th regiments drove them steadily southeastward. Even so, resistance was fierce. The 397th in front suffered so heavily that the regiment's medics were overwhelmed. One broke down completely. The last we saw of him, wrote one private, he was beating his head against a tree before they took him away. For two days, the sentry made slow but steady progress. On the 13th, Burris launched a series of indirect attacks that made gains while minimizing losses. At day's end, his immediate superior, Lieutenant General Edward Brooks, commander of the 6th Corps, a nasty hard driver in the words of one of, of uh, Burris's aides, complained on the phone to division headquarters that there is no way you could have encountered as much opposition as you report. Your casualties were not high enough. Burris calmly replied that his units were gaining assigned objectives through skillful maneuvering. And they proved as much two days later. On the 15th, the 399th attacked and broke through a critical point on the Germans' so-called winter line. The ever-widening wedge forced the enemy into an accelerated retreat that enabled the division to capture strategic Rayon Latap. The breakthrough was truly historic. Through 20 centuries of warfare, no attacker had penetrated a line of defense in the Vosges. Those who had failed included Romans, Huns, Burundians, Swedes, Austrians, Bavarians, Germans, during the Franco-Prussian War of 1870-71, and the French themselves in 1915-16. Hitler had ordered the current defenders to hold to the death, but most refused, and the route was on. Intermittent fighting continued for another 10 days, but by the 25th of the century, in conjunction with other commands, including the celebrated 3rd Infantry Division, was pursuing the enemy up the Bruch River Valley toward the Rhine and beyond the German homeland. The campaign had been fairly won, and a previously untried division had played a major role. Even General Brooks admitted as much. In a letter to Burris at month's end, the court commander noted that, your fine division has written a bright page in the military history of our armed forces. Late in November, General Eisenhower, the Supreme Allied Commander, determined that 6th Army Group should not cross the German border until the forces under Bradley and Montgomery made comparable progress farther north. Ike's decision, rooted in his broad front strategy, was loudly opposed by Devers and has been hotly debated by historians, some of whom believe it prolonged the war in the ETO and cost thousands of lives. Following campaign's end, the century, now temporarily assigned to the 15th Army Corps, was struck through a pass in the mountains to Sarabourg. There it resumed the pursuit of the Germans driven from the Vosges. Early in December, however, the enemy turned and made a stand. 
suddenly attacking, they cut off some of the division's lead elements. A company of the 398th, positioned too far in advance of the rest of the regiment, was captured whole in the village of Vingen Sumburg. At about the same time, a platoon of I Company of the 397th was lured into a trap and surrounded on a hill near Ingweiler. Most of its officers and non coms were shot down, leaving the enlisted men leaderless and confused. Tracer bullets from an unseen machine gun went through the knapsack of Lowry Bowman, who realized that he would not get off the hill alive. He wrote, It is a strange feeling to know you are dead. There is almost a restful sense of resignation about it. I remember hoping it wouldn't hurt too much, but the only real regret I felt about being dead was that there was no way to let my parents know it was all right. By some miracle, he escaped with his life to lead a long and distinguished post-war career in journalism. These costly errors suggested that leadership at the regimental and battalion level was not uniformly adequate. The commanders of the 398th and one of his battalions were relieved. Another high-ranking vacancy had occurred a few weeks earlier when Colonel William Ellis of the 397th had been shot dead inside enemy lines while personally trying to retrieve another lost battalion. The officers who replaced these commanders made no such mistakes. Never again would units of the century be cut off from quick support. Six army groups drive to the north brought Patch's army into attacking distance of the Maginot Line, the massive chain of forts, bunkers, artillery casemates, and above and below ground defenses that straddled the border with Germany in the vicinity of the medieval city of Biche. Strategic necessity dictated that 7th Army could not bypass these defenses as the Germans had when invading France in the summer of 1940. On the morning of December the 14th, Following days of artillery and aerial bombardment that had inflicted little discernible damage on the steel and concrete works, the 398th Regimental Combat Team attacked two critical links in the Maginot Line northwest of Biche, Forts Freudenberg and Schiesek, manned by troops of the 25th Panzer Grenadier Division. Two miles to the west, units of the 44th Infantry Division attacked another grouping of defenses on the right flank of the chain. It was a daunting task for a division that has seen action in only one major operation. However, four days of attacks by the 398th and supporting units against a massive convergence of enemy fire succeeded in capturing or neutralizing every objective. These included each of the 11 separate defenses that composed the Shisek complex, connected by bunkers, tunnels, and underground railways. By the 20th, the century, bloody but energized, was facing eastward, ready to attack fortified Biche, when word came to relinquish advanced positions and assume a defensive posture. Word had come down about Hitler's initially successful counteroffensive in the Ardennes, which had brought on the Battle of the Bulge. Allied forces along the south flank of 12th Army Group had been ordered to move up to the support of their embattled comrades. The ground they evacuated was entrusted to 7th Army. The 100th Division was forced to extend its lines so far to the north and west that it was soon defending territory normally held by three divisions. The extended perimeter was a grave concern at headquarters whose intelligence experts had gotten word of a second pending German offensive, this one in the 7th Army sector via the Saar River Valley. The sentry's position was especially vulnerable considering that several of the Maginot forts remained in enemy hands. Under General Burris's direction, the division crafted a carefully designed defense in depth. Its front line extended for more than a dozen miles northwest of Biche to the farming village of Rimling. Toward the rear were multiple layers of defense but wide gaps separated the division from its nearest supports, the 44th Division on the left flank, and on the right, Task Force Huddleston, a small ad hoc grouping of infantry and light tanks. As they awaited an attack, they were assured would come, but 
no one knew when. The GIs were assailed by bitter weather that lowered physical resistance and morale. As he sat in his foxhole west of Beach, 20-year-old John Corey of Love Company, 399th Infantry, quote, felt like a very old man. I had thought for some time that the war was never going to end. Thanksgiving and Christmas had come and gone and there was no end in sight. What was the use of fighting? We had been living in the rain and snow during one of the coldest winters in recent European history. We shivered as we trudged down on patrols and we were never warm. Death would not have been such a bad alternative. Quickly, however, Corey decided I had to forget such a stupid idea. The German offensive style operation Nord, that is North Wind, began just after dark on New Year's Eve. Hoping to drive a gap between Patch's 6th and 15th Corps, infantry and armored units of German Army Group G struck all along the century's line. Appreciating the division's vulnerability, the, uh, the attackers delivered their heaviest blows against both of the flanks. Though hard pressed from the start, the division held its position, but then disaster loomed. To the west, other 6th Corps divisions began to give way, and soon Task Force Huddleston was in full retreat, uncovering the division's right. Huddle, uh, Huddleston's loss caused some companies of the 399th to give way, but enough troops remained in position to slow the attack in that sector. After a time, forces that General Burris had positioned in the rear, including a regiment on loan from Corps headquarters, counterattacked and recovered most of the lost ground. Meanwhile, at Rumeling, a series of attacks by infantry and an SS Panzer Division, extending into January the 3rd, eventually uprooted defenders from the 397th Infantry. Uh, they were, had been exposed by the fallback of the 44th Division. But they retreated in good order, and they too counterattacked, and these efforts stabilized the lower flank and prevented the Germans from circling into the rear of the 397th. Continuous stubborn resistance eventually slowed the enemy assault in all sectors. As early as January 3rd, Headquarters Army Group G admitted that the offensive had, quote, lost its momentum. Sporadic and effective attacks continued until the 10th, although not until the 25th did Hitler officially call off Nord Wind. By then, although more savagely attacked than the forces to east and west, the century held a line that protruded well forward of the rest of the American position between the Saar and the Rhine rivers. Highly impressed, General Devers publicly praised, quote, the rugged American stubbornness of the combat elements of the 100th Infantry Division, which played a tremendous part in stemming the tide of attack by superior enemy numbers. Over the next two months, the war in northeastern France appeared to have been put on hold. Intermittent action, mostly of the small unit variety, continued, but the Germans appeared increasingly reluctant to test the strength of the American positions. Growing numbers of enemy deserters and easily taken POWs suggested that in this sector, at least, the Wehrmacht had reached the limit of its offensive power. The decrease in activity allowed frontline troops, for the first time in large numbers, to rotate to the rear for rest and refreshment. As often as once a week, portable showers enabled the men to scrub off the grime of the French countryside and don new clothes, a therapeutic experience that can make the grubbiest GI feel like a new man. In the rear, they could also get medical attention for an increasing incidence of disabling ailments, including trench foot, dysentery, and most troubling of all, hepatitis, which the men referred to rather redundantly as yellow jaundice. The source of many of these maladies was the spectacularly unsanitary conditions at the front. As one of the century's medics recalled, there were no latrines. We used our helmets as toilets and dumped it over the side of the foxhole. Food was rarely handled with clean hands. Forget about washing your hands, the medic wrote. Blood and grime covered mine for days at a time. March 1945 ushered in more moderate weather, as well as an improvement in the division's health and readiness. The change was timely, for every GI knew that a final major push into Germany was in the offing. 
It began on the morning of the 15th with a softening up of those Maginot forts that had not been attacked in December and the others that had been captured, abandoned, and reoccupied. When the barrage lifted, the centuries men left their long-held lines and advanced in force against the defenses around Biche, the 397th on the left, 399th on the right, and the 398th, which had been assigned the main effort in the middle. The division's flanks were covered by other elements of 15th Corps, but as during moored wind, large gaps soon opened up on both ends of the line. Pounded by artillery from the forts as well as from Biche, and struck by mortars and Nebelwerfer, uh, rocket-propelled artillery that the GIs called Screaming Mimis, the 398's attack bogged down in a vast minefield short of its objective. To keep the drive going, the 397th on the left pivoted sharply to the east and captured a critical expanse of high ground on the German right flank. Within a few hours, the Germans in front began abandoning their positions but the 398th had cut their line of retreat. As the century's official historian recorded, this success, quote, removed pressure from the attack on the forts and by eliminating supporting fires, caused the Maginot Line to collapse. Throughout the 16th and into the 17th, centurymen flooded into the citadel of Vichy, rooting out its defenders and beginning a pursuit that would end in Germany. Machine gunner Frank Hancock proudly surveyed the captured city. We have penetrated a fortress that stopped the Prussians in 1870, the Kaiser's troops in 1914, the Wehrmacht in 1940, and the 100th Division in December 1944. And we have earned a new nickname, the Sentrymen, Sons of Biche. The movement into the German fatherland was swift by any standard. On March the 24th, the lead element of the division reached the Upper Rhine, and a few days later, the entire division crossed against uh, little opposition into Baumflat and Mannheim. Trucks hastened the companies and battalions southward in the general direction of Stuttgart. The enemy was in full flight, and victory seemed assured. Every GI hoped that the Germans could be induced to surrender short of making a last-ditch defensive effort. That hope died, however, when the division reached Heilbronn on the Neckar River on the morning of April the 3rd. That 700-year-old Swabian city had been pounded to pieces by Allied bombing attacks over the past months, and little progress had been made in removing the rubble. But a few factories continued to turn out war goods, and railroad track and rolling stock remained in operation, as did an officer school in the southern outskirts. To protect these and other resources, the local commander, General Hermann Forsch, determined to make a stand in the city as well as to the north and south, with a force composed of regular units, including the crack 17th SS Panzer Grenadier Division and militia of all ages. For nine days, this motley but determined group would fight with a desperate ferocity, making life hell for the Century Division. The sons of Vich were up against it from the start. General Burris was compelled to cross the Neckar and assault boats. All local bridges had been destroyed. And he had to do so without artillery support, or without armor support, and in full view of artillery on the hills east of the city. The first unit to cross on the morning of the 4th, 3rd Battalion, 398th Infantry, was lured into a trap and almost cut to pieces by Germans who attacked out of the rubble from all directions, including the rear. Headquarters 15th Corps, to which the division was again attached, had failed to discover that the city was undermined by tunnels that facilitated and concealed enemy movements. Beginning on the afternoon of the 4th, the vanguard of the 397th was hustled across the river to rescue its pinned down comrades. Against largely unseen opposition, and pounded by the guns on the heights, they began a block-to-block, building-to-building clearing of the industrial and residential sectors of the city. At times, the fighting was room to room. Squads sent to clear houses filled with snipers would send back messages such as, have captured the living room and are sending out patrols to the kitchen. <laughs> now, at first, the going was frustratingly slow. 
But on the morning of the 8th, tanks were finally sent over the river on a treadway bridge. This speeded up progress, but it came at the expense of killing youngsters and 70-year-olds, many pressed into service by SS officers who threatened to execute any civilian who did not offer armed resistance. On one occasion, a group of Hitler youth shot up a platoon of the 397 and brought its advance to a stop. Unable to determine the identity of the opposition, the platoon leader called in a mortar strike that sent the surviving kids screaming and crying toward their opponents, arms upraised. Their officers shot down several of them as they ran. Not until the 12th was Hagwan declared effectively effectively cleared. Those defenders who had survived were retreating towards Stuttgart with no indication of rallying and the guns east of the city had been abandoned. So too were the defenses to the north and south. Elements of the 398th and 399th had surmounted them in sometimes bitter fighting even as the fighting raged inside Heilbronn. In the weeks preceding Germany's surrender on May the 7th, the Century Division saw further action, but mainly of the small unit variety. After the surrender, the GI settled down to seven months of occupation duty, during which they guarded roads and buildings, removed rubble, diffused mines, policed major towns, detained high-ranking officers and Nazi officials, swept the countryside for weapons, and assumed operation of some factories producing critical goods. Although uh, anxious to return to the States, especially after Japan's surrender in August, uh, most centurymen did not sail for home until December 1945 and January 46. They could uh, look back upon a record of accomplishment, one especially impressive considering the division's early difficulties. They had captured heavily defended objectives, including entire cities, had achieved historic breakthroughs of enemy positions, and had taken nearly 14,000 prisoners, enough to man an average size infantry division. In doing so, centurymen had been awarded three medals of honor, 36 distinguished service crosses, and more than 500 silver stars, while eight companies and battalions had received distinguished unit citations, the collective equivalent of the DSC for individual valor. Many factors were responsible for the century's success, including strong leadership from the top down. Another contributor, certainly, was the thorough training the division had received both in the States and overseas. As Tom Bourne of the 399th summed up, we of the century did not appear on the front as untrained, unmotivated, and hopelessly confused victims, as some modern-day historians have described the typical GI. On the contrary, we were a cohesive and in the final analysis really superbly trained military unit and it showed. We were given a wartime combat assignment and one which we carried out well. Thank you very much. questions you might have, including those on the Civil War. Raise your hands and we'll make our way to the first over here. You talked a little bit about the occupation. When you interviewed the people, did they did they talk about their life during that occupation? I always wondered how soon they took away the ammo when they well, you know, they didn't really talk much about what my father did in his diary. He talked about sweeping the countryside for weapons uh, and how they had to go looking for small towns. and They had to fight against uh, unrepentant Nazis, you know, who were trying to reestablish somehow lines of communication. They had this group of saboteurs and assassins called the Werewolf, uh, which really turns out to have been not nearly as effective as some legends make them out to be. But, they were fifth columnists who had to be overawed too. The, uh, the one thing I remember the most about occupation was when uh, a select number from the division were taken to Dachau to see the death camps. They all had memories uh, 
of what they saw there. And uh, most of it they didn't really want to talk too much about in detail. But it was obvious that of all the post-war duties they performed in Germany, that was the one that stuck in their mind the most. You had uh, made a comment about you hope you did justice to your dad. About what now? You, you had said earlier in the column that you hope you did both justice for your dad. Uh, well, my dad's uh, E Company 397. Mm -hmm. It's actually going to come from my dad's energy level a little down. He wanted to uh, thank you for writing the book. He oh. really enjoyed it. He's actually uh, with E Company in Heilbronn, stuck in a warehouse. Yep. I think that had a major fighting, especially on that first day that they got overseas, because they were the initial units sent over to rescue the lost battalion of the 398th, and they got cut to pieces. Uh, Bill Law, Bill Law was the commander of E Company. He was uh, actually a lieutenant. He'd been promoted to captain only a day after the battle. Uh, Ann and I interviewed him in Richmond in, uh, in 2006, and he was, I guess, about 85, 86 years old. And it was apparent to us that after all these years, he still felt personally responsible for the 58 men of his company that were lost that day. He broke down and cried more than once. It was a very, very uh, difficult kind of experience, but uh, I, I think I put that in, in the book too. He company suffered as much as anybody in that battle and more than most. I'd much rather, you know, get uh, those kinds of comments and reviews than they would from scholars because it, it means more to me that the, the veterans and, and their progeny uh, got something out of the book. I know that uh, Amazon.com has a, a, a page where individual readers can actually write reviews of books that they've read. And uh, a lady from Oregon named Rebecca Wilson wrote into the, into the page about the uh, book I wrote recently and she said that uh, her father had been in the 398th, uh, he was a jeep driver delivering ammunition to the front. And she said that over the years she had tried to get information out of him at Dallas War Service and he would tell her some things, but it was still very hard for her to, to really pin it down because she said she could find hardly anything written about the 100th Division in book form or anything else. So she said they jumped at, the, at my book when they saw it advertised and she got a copy of it gave it to her father, but she said he wasn't able to read it because he died only a week later. He said the last week of his life, he was, uh, he couldn't sleep because he was reliving memories of the war. And I'm wondering now if finding out my book, you know, stirred that up in him. But she said after his death, she went through the book and marked it, and bookmarked it. And she said she found uh, uh, corroboration of everything he had told her in the book. And she, uh, she talked about how important it was that people know the sacrifices that these men made. She kept saying in her review, you know, freedom is not free. These people proved it. And uh, she thanked me personally for writing the book. And that made all the work of research and writing a certain amount, which is always grudgery, worthwhile. big chapter about Heilbronn and it goes into great detail. And that sounds really familiar to me, that whole thing you're mentioning. Did, did I mention your, your father at all in the, in the book? I don't think By so. name? Okay. He really enjoyed his town. You may not have been at that reunion. He talked about uh, the death of his, uh, Bill Wall talked about the death of his friend and, and his second in command, Lieutenant Pete Petraco. He had been shot trying to save another enlisted man from fire. And he said, uh, Pete died in my arms. And he said, uh, uh, something about everybody around me felt quiet because they realized how much I anguish, you know, I was in. And you can't cut that kind of stuff, you know, from talking to Civil War veterans, can't. <laughs> That's why this book meant so much to me. I lost a lot of sleep at night because of the stuff I was reading and writing about. I was also afraid I might not tell the story exactly right or at the proper length or something. That really kept me awake. <laughs> <laughs> 
several nights. I could have almost got to stop reading books, got some sleep. And in the research, you mentioned that there's a German, but the major um, archive of the 100th Division is at the George C. Marshall Library on the campus of VMI. And uh, that is the largest archive, the most thorough archive of any American division in World War II. Everything you want is there. I mean, official reports all copied from the National Archives, and they have some German accounts, and some of which were translated and I was able to use. There was a couple of books written also by German veterans. And an interesting book right here at uh, Carlisle Barracks in the collections here that uh, uh, described Heilbronn in, in great detail, what it was like before the war and what it was like after in Germany, but I was able to translate enough of it so I could get a feel for it. Incidentally, uh, the U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center is a great treasure trove for, for the division. They have the unpublished papers of General Burroughs here. They also have the unpublished papers of his second in command, Brigadier General. Uh, Albert Tyson, and they have the papers of uh, Franklin Gurley, who was the historian of the 399th. He was a veteran of the 399th. After the war, became his historian, and later became the historian of the entire division. Interesting guy. If you watch the Law and Order, you know the part that Sam Waterston played, Assistant District Attorney of New York City. That's what Franklin Gurley was in the 1950s. He was the assistant DA for all of New York. I don't know how he found time to write about history, but he did. And he's got, they've got 12 or 13 boxes of his papers here. Other questions? Time for a little more. Well, thank you for all coming out. I really appreciate it. One more here. One more here. Oh, okay. In reviewing these veterans, did any of them comment about their attitude toward the German populace during the occupation? I don't remember, did they? I don't, I don't remember if they did or not about the Germans outside of the, they kept saying that uh, uh, these were losing something here. Uh, and it, they did mention something about post-war occupation because they talked about how the Hitler, how the Hitler, I'm still not working, how, is there something missing? Yeah, there's something up with that one. They talked about they talked about how some of the people were unrepentant, and they said they were mostly the Hitler youth. These were the kids who'd been indoctrinated with the Nazi uh, propaganda, and uh, these kids refused. And some of their parents also refused to believe that the war was over, and they considered themselves highly superior to these low-class American troops that they would not uh, admit had defeated them in battle. So those were some comments, but. Very little, I, I can remember, they talked about the German people. Uh, very little talk about the post-war period. I really had to piece that together from uh, written sources more than from, from interviews. And I'm not sure if that was because they had bad memories they didn't want to dredge up, or just because the combat overwhelmed everything in their memories and you know, the occupation duty paled by comparison. I have one more question. Oh, here, sir. I thought I was going to go. Thank you. Uh, Civil War. Here you go. <laughs> There's a little known incident where a young lieutenant, I think his name was Castleton, was sent from Pittsburgh uh, to what to St. Mary's to uh, in gold and false bottom wagons uh, because Lee was approaching Jenny Burke. And they didn't want the gold to get into the Union hands, and they sent up the North Central Pennsylvania right oh. Freeway and St. Mary's, and they were to come down the Susquehanna River, and that shipment was lost. And I think what happened was the uh, civilian scout, Collins, I think his name was, uh -huh. and maybe one or two others uh, found out about the gold and uh, bushwhacked their own escort. <laughs> And divided and did the Do you know anything about that? Sir? No, I haven't. I don't know anything about that. See, I'm a World War II historian now. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I, I had not. I wrote a book about the Gettysburg campaign and some incidents in that particular area, but I don't remember that particular one. No. 
What was the name of the, of the person you mentioned at first? Uh, I believe it was a Castleton, a young lieutenant who had malaria. And uh, he was the only one that allegedly knew about the false bottom, the gold in the false bottom wagons. And there were perhaps 10 or 11 um, drivers with him. Sounds like something that should go on the, you know, the History Channel. Yeah, during one of his malaria it's. events, he spotted off about the gold. And I think. Um, uh, that's what triggered everything. And there was a Nothing's been heard of it since? I mean, the city of Harrisburg could use that, couldn't it? <laughs> when you think about it. And I think we'll leave it that so many of us have spent our entire adult lives in. Sir, you've done a great job of doing both of those. And what I'd like to do is present you this reduced copy of your uh, poster on behalf of our director, Colonel, uh, Tom Hendricks, and all of our staff, especially those who helped out while you're here. Thank you very much for this uh, presentation. This has been uh, a great, uh, great 